Qu'est-ce qui yogue Qu'est-ce qui yogue Uh, hello, uh, we are now live from the Venice Biennale as Vardia 7 participants and today Bernard Corey will be joining us in our digital round table session of today. Uh, hi Bernard. <laughs> and now we will share the sh short uh, summary of his background with uh, our audience. Uh, he studied architecture at the Rhode Island School of Design Uh, he received master's in architectural studies from Harvard University in 1993. Uh, in 2001, he was awarded by the Municipality of Rome the honorable mention of Bora Mini Prize uh, given to the architects under 40 years of age. In 2004, he was awarded the archives and he is the co-founder of Arab Center for Architecture and he is also a visiting professor at the Ecole Polytechnique and the American University of Beirut. Uh, he has lectured and exhibited his work in over 120 prestigious academic institutions in Europe and US, uh, including a solo show of his work given by the International Forum of Contemporary Architecture in Berlin and numerous group shows, including you present at the Fondation Sandra Torre the Balbdengo in Turin and Spazio at the opening show of the Maxi Museum in Rome in 2010. And he is also the co-creator and the architect of the Kingdom of Bahrain's National Pavilion at the Venice Biennale's 14th International Architectural Exhibition in 2014. His work has been extens extensively published by the professional press. And he started an in independent practice in 1993 And over the past 20 years, his office has developed an international reputation and a significant diverse portfolio of the projects, both locally and in over 15 countries abroad. Uh, so having shared this brilliant timeline of yours, Bernard, we would now like to give you... Okay. Do you hear me? Attends plus, j'ai plus de son là. Something, something has turned off here. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I will take a few minutes to uh, introduce myself um, to some of my work for those who don't know me and don't know my work. Uh, I imagine a lot of you don't, or some of you don't. So I'll do that first. And then I will briefly speak about uh, my experience with the Venice Biennale, which goes back a few years. But that was an interesting story, so we'll talk about that. And then we'll have a discussion uh, where I'll be taking your questions. So I'm going to start with a slideshow, which is that. Well, for the full screen, please. Okay, so this is me. I uh, come from the Stone Age, like uh, every architect on this planet. We are stuck in the Stone Age because we manipulate uh, matter that is stable, whether it's stone, concrete, steel, uh, glass. Uh, we are stuck in matter and we have a very strange relationship to matter and to uh, temporality. Uh, one that is very different from other creative fields, particularly the creative fields that are today uh, very effective and, 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 and uh, in providing and meaning in our contemporary culture. I think architecture is dragging behind. It's an old story. Uh, it started dragging behind with the advent of modernity, the first acceleration from animal speed to mechanical speed and then to electronic speed lately. Uh, and here we are, completely stuck in the Stone Age. So it's important to understand that. And I think I've had a problem with that uh, quite a while ago uh, when I was at school. Uh, and that made me really uh, start to doubt whether I wanted to keep on going with that profession and that practice as I'm a man who wants to live in the present. I also wanted to be a rock star, but uh, that didn't work. So I... Uh, I gave it a try in the entertainment industry and I started my career, my first built project was a nightclub uh, in Beirut, built on the site of an ex-refugee camp. It is now about 20 years old, it is still alive, uh, 
and still to this day probably one of my most published projects. So, from nightclubs uh, to more entertainment projects uh, that followed after that, this is a sushi restaurant uh, and bar. Most of these projects were temporary projects, or my early pro uh, projects were all temporary projects, meaning they had a lifespan that was predetermined and very short, uh, which contradicts the nature of our practice and this issue of temporality. Again, buildings, uh, and as we are trained as architects to design them and conceive them to a certain extent as atemporal objects or as permanent interventions, uh, it is strange, but as far as I'm, as far as my practice was concerned, in my beginnings, my first six interventions had a very short uh, uh, lifespan, uh, varying between five to nine years. So I owe a lot to Beirut in that sense because it took me from the Stone Age to maybe another kind of temporality. All these projects were built on problematic zones or in zones of that I call under convalescence. Uh, the first one was built on refugee camp. This one was built on the demarcation line that used to separate East from West Beirut. So these zones were still under convalescence and had not reached yet their uh, maturity, at least in real estate terms. Uh, and then after the real estate, uh, the, uh, the, um, the entertainment episode, I started, I was approached by real estate developers and I started building uh, more permanent interventions. This one being uh, um, a kind of a villa at uh, 2,000 meters of altitude uh, in the heights of Mount Lebanon, which basically is another object of, uh, of an instrument of pleasure. Uh, what you see here is its main facade. It has no openings, just a staircase that takes you up, that shoots you up to a pool that allows you to float above uh, the, uh, the peaks of Mount Lebanon at over 2,000 meters of altitude. Uh, this is another instrument of, of pleasure uh, here in Beirut, close to the demarcation line. It is my decadent terrace on, uh, 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 on my apartment, in my apartments, with the two cannons that are pointing uh, straight to the south towards the enemy. Uh, this is again a uh, few examples of my uh, more recent interventions that are now for the real estate uh, developers. So. Although in the beginning I was banned from that sector and I was only given uh, projects that were temporary and for the entertainment sector, developers never thought that uh, they could trust me to build permanent buildings or buildings in which people would raise their kids in, simply because they would associate my profile to spaces of debauchery or just spaces that were not meant to last. Strangely, uh, our, our entertainment projects did extremely well, got a lot of media coverage, so the banks kind of followed and then the developers came in. It all has to do with money at the end of the day. But we've had great experiences with our developers. This is probably, from my residential projects, the one that has that echoes most of my uh, entertainment years. This is a building that we built solely and purely for bachelors, no families, so just a single uh, females and male, uh, just party spaces. Uh, dwellings for, for uh, party goers, no kids, no school buses, no maids, none of that. Uh, and you can basically ride your car or your bike up to your apartment and into your apartment. So I would say these were apartments that were designed for my clients or the clients of my entertainment venues. Uh, the development did extremely well. More recently, probably one of the largest uh, residential projects we've worked on to date which is over 25,000 square meters of exploitable area above ground, uh, over 100 apartments. Uh, this was completed just over a year ago. Um, a very complex story, an impossible project uh, in terms of its site, extremely complex. Uh, and again, a project that really was developed around its, its uh, issues of temporality, again, and the difficulties of the situation uh, in which uh, we were building. From large-scale building to still small interventions, this is uh, a device we built, a military device, um, a drone, which was exhibited at the Sandre Foundation a few years ago, but it's a functional drone. Um, and then more uh, lately, uh, a proposal for a museum for contemporary art in Beirut, where we refused uh, to design a building we proposed the whole, 
the foundations of a museum uh, that we are not ready to build yet, as institutions in Lebanon are not are not no longer operational, uh, don't exist. Uh, and the idea here is that we build a wall and we we might dig a few galleries in the ground, uh, in the guts of the city, uh, to take uh, uh, collections that would be uh, hired by private collectors uh, as we are waiting to build a museum, maybe at a later stage. So this was called stage zero prior to the museum. Uh, a museum solely built and, 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 and thought of for Beirut, uh, a city or, or a city that is not ready yet uh, to come up with an institution that could write or formulate its recent history. Uh, now to Venice. So, my experience with Venice, well, I've never been to the Biennale except once, the Architecture Biennale, and that was in 2014, when I was invited by the Kingdom of, uh, Kingdom of Bahrain to uh, curate and design their pavilion, uh, just a few days after uh, the Ministry of Culture contacted me to give me the uh, this mission, I contacted them back as I looked at what Rem Poulas, who was the curator of the Biennale back then, was proposing. Poulas was saying, to, uh, 1914 to 2014, 100 years of modernity, and for the first time in the history of the Biennale, all the national pavilions had to basically comply or answer or comply to, to the same uh, theme, uh, which was the modernity on their own territory. So I go back to the ministry and tell them that Bahrain didn't have much to say when it comes to that. But maybe if we include all of the Arab world, we'll have an interesting story. The ministry of the Minister of Culture of Bahrain was a brilliant lady and still is at this point, I think, holding that post. And she gave me a green light. So we went ahead and started uh, thinking about what we would do. I teamed up with a friend of mine who is a historian, and I told them, you'd be the brain, I'll be the mason. And basically, more than half of our budget went into uh, the production and the printing of a book, which included 100 specimens of uh, modernist architecture on the Arab territory, on the 22 Arab countries, uh, over 100 years. So we tried to get one per year from 1914 to 2014. So 100 specimens that would give you kind of an idea of how things progressed. The idea here was to try to link uh, architecture to politics, because it's very interesting if you dig a little bit and you try to understand the evolution of modernism in uh, modernism in the Arab world, uh, you cannot but link it to uh, the colonies. We basically uh, were all the Arab countries, the 22 nations, were the inventions of the colonies. And uh, as you know, 1914 is the beginning of World War, World War, World War I, uh, which is the end of uh, the Ottoman Empire. And after, at the end of that, uh, the uh, the colonial uh, nations, uh, basically, as far as we're concerned, the British and the French draw up the map of the Arab world and invent, basically, these countries. So that's how it started. And most of the modern projects that were produced from 1914 and on were, to start with, either projects that we inherited from the colonies, institutional projects, and later on, uh, a modernity that was really uh, in, a, uh, inherited or very much influenced by what the colonies had left behind. Uh, a very rich history, uh, one could say, uh, very interesting specimens, mainly in Egypt, in Iraq, in Lebanon, and Syria. So things were happening a bit more west, not further east in the Gulf, as not much was happening back then. And and then you see that the first 20 or 30 years of the glorious years of, 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 of these nation states that were all aiming at being modern nations were quite interesting, architecturally speaking. Then you see, uh, towards the late 60s, the early 70s, the emergence of either dictatorships or civil wars, if it's the case in Lebanon. Slowly but surely, the nation state kind of crumbles, and with it, the modern project, and with it, modernism, uh, as a whole. So it's interesting to see that modernism in architecture is very much linked to a political project, extremely, I mean literally. Uh, so we decided to uh, do our interventions around that, and it consisted of putting a huge map of the uh, 22 states, and on this map, uh, pointing, putting uh, uh, 
the location of the 100 buildings that you find in that book, by the way, the book was offered for free, it was a 180 pages book that was given away for free to all the visitors, 40,000 copies, above um, the table, uh, around which there were 22 chairs, one chair for each country, uh, there was a big uh, installation, video installation uh, on the ceiling, which included 22 faces of the same um, uh, artist or, or performer who was reciting the national anthem of each one of the 22 countries. So when you came into the space, it was kind of a sound installation where there was a complete chaos uh, you couldn't understand what this guy was saying because the 22 speeches were spoken at the same time. Uh, kind of uh, very much uh, reminiscent of the situation of the Arab world today. Very chaotic uh, and not uh, the, the, the complete failure of uh, what was intended to be a unified project that never really flew. So if you look closely at these numbers, you'll see flags and the flags are in fact the origins of the consultants who designed these projects, most of them being Anglo-Saxon. Uh, then, we proposed this, and then at the opening of the Biennale, very interesting, on the 7th, if I remember correct, the 7th of June of 2014, uh, the front page of every single newspaper on the planet announced the uh, invasion of Mosul by ISIS. And ISIS was brought to the world. No one really knew much about ISIS until that day. That was the day of the opening of uh, the Biennale and our pavilion. Very strange, an, an incredible coincidence, because ISIS represents really the end of the nation state, or the notion of nation state, and modernity and modernism in the Arab world. Uh, so it was really to the point, 100%, a pure, 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 pure luck, uh, as far as I'm concerned, but uh, it was literally as blunt as could be. Strangely, no debate with any architect uh, was uh, taken to the level of politics. We got a lot of press because the space was spatially interesting, uh, a lot of coverage because of the architecture of the pavilion, but nothing for its political content. At this point, I realized architecture critics have a serious problem. And I think architecture critics and the academy in general has become completely depoliticized. When it comes to modernity and modernism, it is a serious problem. And the epitome of that, in my opinion, is Ram Poulas's installation that year on uh, modernism and what he has done, which to me was a sinister autopsy on a cadaver, which was modernism. Uh, what it was was basically a collection of what uh, the machine age or uh, uh, the machine age has produced, uh, or the mechanical age, in uh, architecture. And that was purely the end of it, a catalogue of that. But no reference to uh, the political dimension of uh, modernism. And that, I think, is an extremely dangerous thing to do. And I think Ram Kulas is a dangerous man because he's a cynical dinosaur, of course, but he has created, uh, I think, very, a very dangerous, what I call comfortable radicality. With his, uh, with his methods of research that have now become universal. Every single kid in every school from India to the US uh, to uh, you, know, you name it, uh, has basically inherited of that virus, which has become uh, like a, a growing cancer that has metastasized all over. So uh, the result, I think, of that, of my, uh, my, my, uh, my, uh, my, my, uh, my, my uh, meeting with 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 uh, with the academy or the academic world in Venice to me was a complete flop, as far as I'm concerned, because I believe that architecture is a political act, and uh, and I don't see it happen in schools. I don't see it happen at the Biennale. I think that Biennale in 2014 was just basically a big a parade of archives, of fetishism, of of uh, modernist aesthetic, uh, which is to me a complete uh, disgrace for our fathers and grandfathers, the true moderns who were, first of all, politically engaged. Voila. So can I have my face back? And I can take your questions now.
thank you so much for your wonderful speech. Uh, we will start with our questions then. Who'd like to start? Okay. Hi, Bernard. Um, thank you for, uh, for the lecture. Uh, I would begin to ask you about uh, the topic of uh, this year, Biennale, um, titled Free Space. Uh, so you was mentioned about um, your work um, engaged with the permanent and the temporality. Um, so I wonder, is, is the theme uh, of free space today, uh, what is the challenge um, in between um, work and the temporality work uh, of you in relationship of what you think about the definition of uh, free space? Okay, that's very interesting. Well, that's very interesting. Very interesting parallel drawing between uh, the temporality and and uh, this idea of, of free or freedom. I think we architects have a have a serious problem when it comes to uh, uh, our accountability, our accountability uh, relative to context and relative to time. So our missions usually are quite long in time. It takes us sometimes four, five, six, seven, eight, ten years to complete a project. So between the time we conceive of it and at the time it gets executed, years can go by. And by the time it's executed and, it's, and it comes to life and it faces another reality, uh, and years go by and decades go by, things happen. So this accountability that the architect has initially as he is conceiving of these projects uh, and is faced with this issue of permanence because he has to put something that's going to be erected. I started my lecture with me looking like a monkey saying that I am uh, stuck in the Stone Age. There is truth to that because we design buildings and we are stuck with this idea of permanence. At least we're accountable for what our, me what our buildings will mean 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years from now as they'll still be around when I will be six feet on the ground. So there's a problem, I think, of accountability, which uh, becomes extremely heavy on, uh, on the architect when he's conceiving of his work, if he's thinking responsibly. Uh, so when you're doing temporary projects, it's a bit different. Because when you're doing temporary projects, you're doing projects that are very spontaneous. Uh, it was the case of this first six project I built. They had a very limited dive, uh, time span, so they, I had a kind of a certain certitude about what I was stating at a very particular moment in time. Uh, I knew that the conditions I was going to deal with, first of all, they were conceived in a very short period of time, and they were built in a very short period of time, and they were supposed to go five years later or six, seven years later, which means that pretty much they were conceived in their present, and that'll be it. And I wouldn't have to worry about what they would mean 15, 20, or 50 years uh, from now, because they'll be gone anyway. So that gives you, yes, a certain amount of freedom, and with it comes a certain a relative. Uh, with this with this freedom, it comes also uh, it gives you the means to do things you wouldn't do if you were working in permanence. It it makes you assert things with a lot more guts and courage, because you're not accountable on the long run. Uh, and it's very interesting to see that those first six projects, yes, they were at small scale, but I, I controlled every single detail of them down to the ashtray. I produced situations by creating every single object from the lighting fixtures to the ashtrays, to the elevators. They were all built in situ. They were instruments that were uh, basically under my control and that were basically uh, there to... Uh, abide by the scenario that was created by ourselves at a very specific moment in time. Obviously, this does not apply and cannot apply to projects once uh, they go into the permanence, uh, once they become permanent. So this issue of temporality uh, versus freedom, I think, is a very pertinent, pertinent question. 
I don't know if this answers your question. I don't know if this answers your question. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about about actually your previous work. So how was working in producing or thinking about architecture in a post-war country? Because, I mean, you, did you get any inspiration from the social problems of the city? Because you start to your presentation with your first built work and it was a nightclub just next to a slum or a kind of a refugee neighborhood. I mean, that's why I just want to, I'm so curious about the effects of the civil war on you and your projects. Thank you. Well, I started, uh, I started my career uh, in the early 90s, which were supposedly the early, the so-called post-war years. Uh, back then, we were promised uh, the rebuilding of a nation, um, a great reconstruction project, uh, very much capitalistic, uh, like it or not, it was a project. Uh, I did not appreciate it uh, completely, with the reconstruction project of Beirut. I had a lot of problems with, I had a, a lot of problems with its relationship to history, with the fact that it did not, it did not address uh, questions that were very sour, that had to do with our recent past and our unresolved conflicts. Uh, in fact, prior to coming to Beirut, I had worked on a project called Evolving Scars, I think the scars of a city, to me, the scarring process was extremely important. It was not an issue of being a fetishist of the war or trying to aestheticize the war, which is, I think, a current that came later, particularly in contemporary art and artists of my generation in the Arab world kind of surfed that wave. I don't think this was my intention, but I think it was about trying to uh, address issues and questions of memory that were very central and very important in my work back then. Uh, usually, in, in, in stable countries or in, uh, in the Western world, uh, in post-war situations, we see it after, after World War II, we see it after the fall of the Berlin Wall. In, 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 in convalescence periods, uh, the, the rewriting of history through architecture and urban planning is quite a problematic question. Very often, we have the tendency to uh, have some kind of amnesia, to go to some kind of amnesia. We see a lot of amnesia in post-war situations. But here, it took on an incredible dimension. We were totally amnesic. The reconstruction of Beirut, at least through the project that was taken over by a private company, led by our prime minister, was totally amnesic to anything that had to do with the young republic and, and all the unresolved political problems that came with it. History started with archaeological digs, uh, so we went through the Phoenicians, the Romans, the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, and so on and so forth, all the way up until the, the Ottoman Empire, some remnants of the French uh, uh, colonies, but then history stops in 1943. And, and nothing is left of the young modern nation in the history of the city center when we rebuilt our capital. And I think that's extremely dangerous. We see that in the Arab world, uh, I think, uh, throughout this impossibility of existing in the present. This is why I think everything that is happening in the Gulf, take Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Qatar, and so on, all these cities that have developed in the last 10, 20, 30 years at an incredible pace are extremely pathetic because they cannot exist in the present. Their only reference to history are postcards created by the West, fantasies, Western fantasies of uh, Arabs, and then the future is a modernity that is important. I think the problem of the Arab is his impossibility to exist in the present. So what I tried to do back in the late 90s was to exist in the present, try to deal with problems that had to do with our recent past and how we could start scarring our cities, the, the scarring process of our cities uh, through architecture, which I believe is a political act. I don't know if this answers your question. Well, going off of that, I wanted to ask two questions, I think related to what my friend just asked. So after the civil war, I think you put it really well that Lebanon kind of adopted the nation state as a project, and that led to a society that was very different than 
what it was before the civil war all the levantines left the jewish population left and you were left with a more monodimensional population that was significantly different than uh, what lebanon was before the war and uh, in your project about the uh, that you did for the biennale you mentioned that you collected 22 arab states including lebanon so i'm also like curious about how whether you identify Lebanon as a, like a significant, like just a predominantly Arab state now, and your effort to collect the works of the Arab states and present them in the Biennale, was that an effort to um, cope with or to just present that previously unhistoricized history to a Western audience? Was it a way to cope with the colonial past of those countries? Well, I, I wouldn't totally agree with you on the fact that the, the, the social fabric and the, the cultural fabric of, of uh, this territory, you want to call it Lebanon, I don't even know if it's a nation, to be honest with you, has drastically changed. Yes, we have, we have lost the Jewish community, that is true. We have lost a good number of Armenians, a certain percentage of the Christian community, true. But there are still quite a good number of Christians here. And I hate to speak of our, our social and cultural fabric purely in terms of, in terms of, of ethnicity and, and, uh, and religion. Um, and in fact, if we still speak about religion, it's because we failed to build a nation state. If there was a nation state, we wouldn't be speaking of Muslims, Christians, Sunnis, or, or Shiites, or so on and so forth, or Jews. It would not matter. We would be speaking about a national project. That we have failed to do, just like I think uh, every single one of the 22 Arab nations, I think, has pretty much failed to a certain degree. I think uh, Lebanon has attempted, has its, it had its attempt between the mid 40s up until the late 60s, early 70s, at becoming a modern nation. And there was, in Beirut and in Baghdad and in Cairo, uh, uh, even a first and a second generation of modern architects who thought that they were really part of a greater of a greater movement, that they were part of a game. I think my father was part of those. Uh, and when Oscar Limeo too, came to Beirut in the 1960s, my father told him he was a dinosaur because he thought, my dad thought, that he was at the forefront of modernity back then, completely convinced. So you had Arabs, not only in architecture, in music, in cinema, who were totally convinced that they were part of a global project, of a global modern project. This was back then when there were global certainties, obviously. This has failed, not only in the Arab world, but uh, throughout the world. And then we were started re-questioning these global certainties in architecture way before the 60s, or it became very clear in the 60s and afterwards. So you can retrace uh, in the history of architecture, of the, of the modern architecture of the Arab world, in a very blatant way, uh, the, the failure of, of modernism and even the notion of the nation state, uh, even beyond just the Arab world. I mean, take France, for instance, huh, which during, uh, not so long ago, during the Mitterrand years, was really uh, not just a socialist country uh, by label, but you look at the city of Paris, it was built by the state. Huh? Today, you look at uh, the, the territory, uh, the urban uh, fabric in Paris, most of the intervention, the overwhelming uh, majority of what's being built is no longer in the hands of the state, but is in the hands of the private sector. It does not only apply to architecture, but to so many other issues that have to do with our culture, uh, with our education, with our health, and so on and so forth. So today, the notion of the state is no longer what it was uh, back uh, during the early days of modernism uh, and uh, the early days of the notion of the nation state. So that, that the, I think the Arab world is an exaggeration or, 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 or a kind of a, a, a situation gone really bad, but you see a, a lot of that also in the Western world. I don't know if this answers your question.
Um, I would like to uh, continue with um, another question related uh, to your uh, criticism about the pedagogy right now is the focus is uh, too much on the research. Uh, and uh, I think oftentimes they actually use um, the what's so-called extra architectural um, um, kind of uh, research or documents to justify the work itself. Um, and you was just mentioned about like your work try to um, assist in the present and resolve the current the problem. Um, so I wonder what is the the ideal uh, way of teaching for you right now, and what 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 are you thinking about um, um, the mode of um, teaching in the school um, um, in this period of time, where a lot of uh, things start to change and and happen constantly um, because of the uh, social network. Thank you. Well, I, I, uh, I'm really not interested in, in what's happening in the schools I attended, at least, when I was a student uh, 25 years ago or so. Huh? I think nothing can come out of Harvard these days, or MIT, or Columbia, or, as a matter of fact, most of these big uh, universities that I attend every once in a while for juries or lectures. I am not sensitive to what they're sensitive to, and they are not sensitive to what I'm sensitive to. We're just a different breed. Huh? Uh, so that's number one. You were talking about research, and I briefly talked about this, this, this cancer, this virus, that was introduced pretty much towards the end of my school years. I remember these uh, research projects that were led at Harvard on China, on shopping, or whatever, and that produced very thick books like this with a lot of very cute graphics and a lot of data. Data, 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 and more data. So that became a trend, and, and it still is to a certain extent. Uh, it became this sort of very comfortable uh, uh, radicality uh, that I was referring to earlier whereby you just go, uh, you collect a lot of shit, you put it uh, in a very cute graphic manner. Infographics are great because you can put in one page a uh, quantity of information that would take you uh, uh, 50 pages sometimes to, uh, to, to document. But you get all of that, inf this gener generic information out of data that you uh, get from uh, libraries uh, and, and the internet and so on and so forth. And what you try to do at the end of the day is to come up with definitions of that territory. Huh? So you approach a territory and you collect a lot of shit and a lot of data and you do your homework. You give yourself a month or two or three or whatever to collect as much shit as you can and you think you've done your homework at the end by, let's say, you're studying Kuwait, so you try to see uh, how many liters of, of, uh, of, of milk uh, your average Kuwaiti drinks a year or how many eggs a Kuwaiti kid uh, 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 consumes a month. Huh? That's the kind of data that you put and you collect more and more data, as much data as you want, and cute graphics that, at the end of the day, make you think that you you have done your homework. You are going to produce now definitions of that territory. And if you're really, really wise, you're going to go and consult a few local critics uh, that you basically fit uh, the definitions uh, and the trends that you're completely a slave of. And at the end of the day, we're going to try to produce definitions. Well, that's exactly the contrary of everything I do. I am anti-definition. I am anti-theory, by the way, uh, because definitions basically are uh, consensual. Huh? They're consensual definitions. Theory produces consensual definitions of a territory. And by doing that, it basically defines the common denominator that it finds on every single subject or issue on this territory. So it, it basically dismisses everything that does not fall into these common denominators. It states, it might state a few exceptions here and there, but it's only, it's only worried about producing definitions, consensual definitions. I, it is exactly at the opposite of everything I do. I'm obsessed with 
the specificity of a situation. I have completely given up on trying to define the territories in which I intervene. For me, the territory is the situation itself. It is uh, the commissioner of the project, who might be a pilot, a banker, a real estate developer, a whore, a slut, a bitch, I don't care, okay? But it is the specificity of the situation itself, its impossibilities, financial, economical, whatever. And certainly not trying to make that project abide by a kind of a consensual definition of the territory. And this is how, in my opinion, you produce context to become part of history, not by perpetuating simplistic, dangerously simplistic definitions of the territory. So I'm anti-research. I am uh, at war with people who do that, and I'm not interested in that. Beware of what's happening in the big schools, particularly in the West. And I've, in fact, spent some time in Turkey a couple of years ago, uh, where I gave a, a studio, and I found a lot more curiosity in, uh, you know, in the minds of students that come out of Beirut, Istanbul, or, you know, uh, countries that still have that kind of uh, immunity to, uh, to the comfortable radicality that is the dictatorship of this comfortable radicality that comes to us from these big schools and uh, the cynical and the wise. I don't know if this answers your question. Uh, building off of that, I wanted to, again, go a little deeper on the question of anti-research and anti-definition and the current state of the pedagogy. Um, so I agree with you on the fact that Ram Kulas is a very dark personality in the history of architecture, especially after the 70s, because he basically came up with the architecture to deal with a world that is more run by private companies than states. I was like, what you just said about like, you know, states being replaced by private entities, it really resonated with me. And I think that's like a fact of reality after the 1970s. And Rem Kool has found a space to do architecture in that changed world. And now flash forwarding into our time, you're working with real estate developers. Um, but how do you find space within that realm uh, using your like, anti-research and anti-definition methods to be political while working for, you know, private entities? Well, I think, I think that uh, it is time that architecture tries to redefine its territories of intervention uh, when it comes to producing uh, work that is politically relevant. I don't think that architecture that is politically relevant should be limited to uh, institutional projects. I don't think that architecture that is politically relevant should be limited to social housing, museums, uh, uh, opera houses, uh, and so on and so forth. Projects that are, uh, that are commissioned by the state. Museums are, in my opinion, the cemeteries of culture, but that's another story. So I think that if we stick to that, we'll be missing the boat. First of all, because uh, architecture that is solely produced for institutions is extremely accountable. Once more, if you're designing a museum, a memorial, uh, 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 an opera house, you, are, uh, you have to abide by a certain logic that is given to you by the state, a collective consensual logic. This basically limits your ability or your, your margin of taking positions that might be uh, radical, if relevant, at this, on a specific situation. You can't do it. You basically, politically, your agenda is already predetermined by the commission itself and the weight of it, the weight of the institution that is behind it. On the other hand, if you're designing a barbershop, or you're designing a restaurant or a nightclub, or, in fact, uh, a development project for the rich, hmm? not the poor, you're certainly not accountable politically for the meaning of your project. And this is where you can do things, when you're not accountable, when your political agenda is not defined by uh, the weight of the institution that is behind it. So I think nothing can come out today out of France, for instance, or Holland, or Italy, or, you know, these are stable, sleepy countries where citizenship has produced dormant citizens, politically dormant citizens, 
Their worries are extremely futile for me. My worries are about literally survival issues that are very, very, very uh, uh, basic and extremely fundamental. Uh, their worries to me are extremely futile. They have lost uh, the, the political uh, uh, recul, huh? the political distance. Uh, and look at basically what 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 the political debates are about. So at the end of the day, I don't believe that we should uh, stick to this idea of of architecture with the big A only happening in uh, in institutional projects. It worked at the time when we were we had global certainties. The modern project produced yes could only be produced and reach its fullest dimension in the realm of of, uh, of 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 uh, institutional projects, the state. But today, it's much much different. Huh? Uh, we're done with certainties. We should really try to understand the specifics of every situation, and no matter how sour they are, we have to have the courage to address them. Architects should do that. And I don't see happening. I don't see this happening. Not in schools. I don't see this happening. And uh, not in 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 architecture. Uh, media, I don't see it happening in history books. I still see the jerk of academics looking at architecture only through the lens of the politically correct, the green, uh, you know, the social housing, the good stuff, the good guy, uh, the guy who doesn't eat meat, who doesn't smoke, who doesn't do drugs, who doesn't fuck, and so on and so forth. It's about time that we look at architecture uh, not in a dark way like Kulas does, because I don't think he's dark, I think he's just cynical and boring. But we look at architecture in the sound realities of our cities that are not in the museums, but they are in the barber shop, in your the next door grocery store, or uh, in your nightclub. This is where culture is happening. If you don't see that, the city will happen despite you and without you. And it's about time that architects understand that and have the humility to intervene in those sectors and see and understand the political dimension of those. I don't know if this answers your question. Thank you, Bernard, for uh, answering all of our questions and sparing your time for us in your busy schedule. It was wonderful, your speech and your, all of your answers. Thank you so much. Uh, hoping to join you again in another discussion. <laughs> so, see you. <laughs> Goodbye. Ciao. Goodbye. Ciao.